This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. I'm your host, Robonzo. This podcast features conversations with me and indie music artists. Conversations intended to help other indie musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. Hey kids, thanks for tuning in. Two things before I tell you about my guest for this episode. First, if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe. You can do that wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Why subscribe? You'll always be privy to the latest episodes as they are released. Plus, you will be helping other musicians find this podcast. The second thing is, please consider signing up for the Unstarving Musician community. By doing so, you'll receive helpful insights that I have picked up over the many years that I have worked as a gigging musician, plus those I've garnered from the hundreds of conversations I've had with other musicians, including those who've been interviewed on this podcast. And you'll get a free copy of the official ebook version of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, written by yours truly. If you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. To do so, just go to unstarvingmusician.com and you'll find out how to do it right there. My guest for this episode, Benoit Glazer, is a conductor, arranger, trumpet player, and multi-instrumentalist. He was also the conductor for Cirque du Soleil's La Nuba in Orlando, Florida. He and his wife have created something extraordinary, which has become the Tumukua Arts Foundation. What started out as house concerts to fill a gap in their music-loving hearts has become a mission to present and inspire great music and art in Central Florida through performance and education. Benoit and his wife, Elaine, literally put everything they had into creating a home that is, by all accounts, a truly impressive performing arts center. It's somewhat difficult for me to explain what they're doing in their community in this short intro, so in addition to listening to this conversation in which Benoit tells the story, you can and should check out timukua.com, and yes, I'll spell that for you, it's T-I-M, like Mary, U-C-U-A dot com, and the TEDx talk featuring Benoit and his wife Elaine. You can search YouTube for Benoit Glazer TEDx Orlando, and Benoit, if you're like me, and that's an unusual name, it's B-E-N-O-I-E. Links will, of course, be in the show notes. So without further ado, here is me and Benoit Glazer. How did, um, so you and I were connected by Brad Kuhn. Uh, Tell me about how you met. Well, Brad, um, well, Brad is a writer uh, and he was involved with the uh, Jack Kerouac project here in Orlando in uh, College Park, which is like a, a, I guess, a neighborhood in in uh, in Orlando, Jack Kerouac lived there at his mom's for when he wrote uh, on the road, you know, uh, and so um, so he was involved and he came here because we have literary events and so, you know, so maybe I should like just I don't know how if you introduce your your. Uh, your guests, you know, like, and, or, or whatnot, but basically like we've been having hosting concerts and events, I should say concerts, I call them concerts, but there's all kinds of arts represented, mm-hmm. uh, since 2000. And so, and I, and he came to the new house after 2007. So we basically, um, you know, we started these events in our normal suburban home, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, eventually we ran out of room. Like in 2004, we had a choice to make because, uh, you know, basically like our concerts became too successful and we, you know, parking was an issue and there was no room in the house. Like people were going the backyard and everywhere and we had to open the windows for people to get the concert it was getting ridiculous and so i said okay well we can pull back or stop doing these things or we can you know uh design and build a house that's more suitable for these events and so my wife and i uh thought about it and of course it mean it 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 meant and it still means like that we'll never be able to retire because basically we took our life savings and um past and future and uh, put them into that project. And so, but we decided to do it and she was always supportive and uh, cra- as, she's as crazy as me. And so, <laughs> and so we, we did that. We, we, you know, our, our house back then was like basically like three months from being paid off and we remortgaged it and we, you know, found a lot downtown Orlando um, that has a lot of parking uh, and, 
you know, and it's a very suitable spot, like geographically, as far as it's easy to access and everything. And anyway, so we uh, we did that. We built this house with a 125 seat auditorium in the living room and, a, you know, full uh, state of the art recording and broadcast studio. So I have a f- right now a four camera set up. I'm hoping to get six cameras. Uh, my next generation of, of uh, video setups going to have six cameras. Um, and, uh, and by the way, everything is uh, available online from wherever you are, of course, uh, live when we have our events live, you can watch. And so, um, and I keep those online for a few hours after the fact so that people in different time zones have a, uh, a chance to, uh, to, to watch it. And then I, I make it private and then I, I make videos f- for the performers and the, they control the video up after that point. And so, um, anyways, to come back to Brad, Brad came and basically recited this writing and, um, uh, you know, other people writings because he was involved in the, in the Jackie Rack project. Um, and so that's how we met. And that's, um, you know, and now basically he's in Jacksonville. We were in Orlando, uh, but he has a, he has a, a, a marketing and public relations business and he, you know, we hired him to do our marketing and public relation for us. And, and uh, so he's still doing writing for us, but just a different way. <laughs> well, I want to read what, what um, Brad had said. And I guess I didn't lead you into that question very fairly, but you did a great job. And you mentioned a couple of important things um, before I read that. I guess I'll highlight those. And they are that your wife, Elaine, and you did a wonderful TEDx talk that where you discuss your journey from having small concerts in your initial home to spending your life savings in retirement to build what is basically a theater, a uh, performing arts theater, and also, uh, forgive me, I think I'm going to mispronounce it, Timukua, how do you say it? Timukua, Timukua, yeah, Timukua. Timukua Arts yeah, Foundation. The, 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 but wait, yeah, before, exactly. before I let you continue, let me read you what, what Brad said really quick. Um, he said okay. a lot of nice things about you, and I can see why, but he said, um, I met them by accident when I heard a rumor that the music director for Lanuba opened up his home on Sunday nights his night off for free concerts and that guests were encouraged to bring um, wine and a snack to share. The rumor turned out to be true. The music ranged from the phenomenal to the bizarre and and in parentheses creative noise, but it was always spectacular. Every performance was accompanied by a local painter uh, whose art would be displayed around the room and who worked throughout the performance to create a um, new work before our eyes. And that is what you and your wife Elaine, um, uh, described in part at uh, in that um, um, TEDx, and also um, to underscore something else you said, you archive all of these performances on a wonderful uh, Vimeo page where people can check out um, many many past performances. Yeah, we 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 actually what I do is I actually um, I usually do a trailer, then one full song or a full like excerpt of a play or whatever like a scene or something like this, a little bit more complete, if you will. And then I do the whole performance. And so I use the short videos. I call I, you know, I divide them in short videos and long videos. And so the short videos are both on YouTube and Vimeo. Um, and the long video is on Vimeo only, and it's private and password protected. And so I've had um, performers before who, for example, will download it, re-upload it, monetize it, and they print like business cards with a unique code on each card. And then so they sell those at uh, ulterior performances. So they have they, they get something like an economic development tool for them, as well as a promotional tool, of course, the short videos are. And so that's why I put them on YouTube, because it's m- more searched and more, uh, you know, I, more users, um, you know, use YouTube mm-hmm. and can find that stuff. But uh, Vimeo has, uh, you know, they're more easily downloadable. The, the, the audio is treated a little differently. The video is actually treated a little differently on Vimeo. And so it's a little bit easier for me to essentially share these with the performers uh, through v- Vimeo. But we, so if people are curious, they can actually go on YouTube at the Timuqua Arts channel or on Vimeo at the Timuqua channel and they will find us and they will find like yeah, hundreds of videos um, archived, you know, trailers and things. And it's always possible. I always tell people on, in the description, Hey, this is just an excerpt, like, or this is just a trailer. 
um, you know, the trailer would be like short excerpts from every song that they've performed, for example, but it's like two minutes long. And uh, I will say, if you want to see the whole thing, contact so-and-so, like whoever performed, right? And is in control of that, uh, of that video so that they can decide to give that password away or sell it or do whatever they want. Like they, they you know, I want the performers to retain control over, uh, that product. And, um, but we do that for them for free because we, it, you know, um, it's part of the services that we offer. And, you know, essentially our whole model is divided into, I mean, it's, it's a two part model. So first of all, like our Sunday, uh, events are open house, which means it's pay what you want. Um, and so, and then our weeknight, we have the occasional, I mean, once or twice a week, we'll have a weeknight event. Those are master series events. Those are ticketed events are $20 right now. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you're a member, you can get in for $10 or if you're military or student. So, and then we have our Saturday afternoon series, which is $5 and free for kids under 18. So we trying to reach, uh, different audiences with different concerts, obviously, for for example our programming model is like on sundays the month is divided into four uh sundays sometimes there's five but i mean essentially like it'll be one it will be classical that and i mean that in the widest of senses of 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 the of sense so it's like a very wide definition of classical the other one will be jazz so it'll be again a very wide definition of jazz uh, the ne- the other one will be uh, Latin or folk or world, and that's also obviously very wide. And then the fourth one will be more literary in nature, so we call it alternative internally, but it's like plays, you know, independent film, uh, poetry, book readings, uh, literary events of different kinds, and or sometimes music that is actually impossible to define or that contains a lot of spoken word. And so... Um, Basically, those are our our Sundays. And so what we're trying to do there is some people only like one genre of music. And so they can still come once a month at the house. Like, you know, we keep the habit of of coming regularly to the house, you know. And uh, and then our our Master Series concerts, well, those are usually dictated by... Um, the the routing of the of the of the tours that the that performers have, and so mm-hmm. uh, you know we try to avoid flying somebody from Japan just to play here because that would be way too expensive. And so we right. catch the Japanese performers when they're in, in you know, and they're the ones who contact us. But they they know they're touring the, the United States, and so they will when they come in the south, they, they will contact us. Say, hey, we're going to be in your area and in that time period. Do you have something for us? And then we'll see if we do. And then hopefully we do. And and that's how that works. And you folks are booked out um, over a year now? Is that right? Oh, yeah. A year. I mean, we could book like way longer. Like for a while, I was booked two years ahead of time. But then I found that it was uh, actually taking away a little bit of versatility when some like super big name and somebody we've been wanting to have for a long time, they wanted to come and and we were like, already booked every night that week or something like like it's crazy and because of the videos like you know this is a small organization and and uh we don't have a lot of staff and so basically you know i i do all of the technical stuff and so i you know i also you know clean the room after the event and i you know i set up the room i you know and we have an extensive back line which it was is one of the thing that differentiates us from other venues is that you know we have a you know, world famous upright bass, for example, of course, the piano, I have a drum set, you know, amps, uh, all kinds of instruments and percussion instruments, all this, that kind of stuff. So that people can avoid um, traveling with these large items uh, or they can just leave them in the van if, if they're traveling by van. And they're usually uh, because I like to set everything up ahead of time. It allows me more time to do a, a good setup and make sure the mics are all in the right places and all that stuff. And, um, and then, you know, I do the videos. And so the next day, the day after the event, you know, I'm busy, you know, editing and, and rendering and uploading videos. Um, and so if we have events on consecutive, consecutive days, 
there's only a, so many days I can do before I burn out. <laughs> we are going to break to listen to a track that Benoit gave me. It is something he calls Mardi Gras at Timikua. It uh, features some samples of Benoit's trumpet playing, and it's from a 2004 CD that he wrote and produced. So let's give it a quick listen. I'm speaking with Benoit Glazer, conductor, arranger, multi-instrumentalist, and co-founder of the Timukua Arts Foundation. I asked him about the technical skills that he was acquiring along the way of creating this concert hall experience. Here's what he had to say as we continue our conversation. Before coming to Orlando, I lived in a studio. I was a studio musician in Montreal, uh, and so I've been, you know, mixing and writing for jingles and, you know... I was in the studio all the time. So I have, a, and I used to have a sound company, like live sound company as well in Montreal. So I, I've been doing sound since the mid eighties. Mm -hmm. um, so the technical aspect, I've been, you know, uh, immersed in that for decades, but um, the video was, is a little bit newer for me, for sure. I mean, I started filming in 2007. So, mm -hmm. you know, before that I Never did that, so that was that was new. Uh, and of course, my job at Cirque du Soleil here for eighteen years, I was the conductor for the Cirque du Soleil. But you know, musical director for a show like that, uh, you know, it's a six-piece band with two singers. But if you saw the show, you think that it was a you know thirty-five-piece band, and and so it was a hybrid, one of these hybrid bands where you know you're dealing with a lot of technology, and so you're dealing with live musicians and technology, and this is a much, much, much how should I say, like heavier train to stop or to maneuver, you know, oh, like sure. it's just a, it's a much, much bigger ship to steer, so to speak. And so it's a, so I've been, uh, you know, I've been dealing in MIDI since MIDI came out in the early eighties. And so, um, so I was, you know, I was always kind of the, at the leading edge of technology, if you want to talk, you know, call it that. But so the technical stuff, it's just time consuming, no matter how my workflow, how well my workflow is set up, it's just time consuming. Video doesn't, you can't like, you know, it takes time to render, it takes time to edit, it takes time to, to upload, you know, this is just how it is. And so, um, but to come back to our model, like basically, you know, the, 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 the nonprofit is called Timukua because when we started these concerts at the first house, uh, we were in the Timucua neighborhood in Hunters Creek in a suburb of Orlando, and it, they came to be known as the Timucua Concerts. And so we called the nonprofit the Timucua Arts Foundation because it made sense. And Timucua, me, it, it, it's, it was a, a Native American tribe who lived in Florida and um, in areas uh, where food was plentiful, so they didn't have a lot of weapons and they did, certainly did not have... Uh, the right antibodies to survive uh, exposure to uh, Europeans when they first came. And so they were, they basically disappeared very quickly um, because uh, they, they weren't equipped or um, to fight, <laughs> you know, and so they disappeared. But they also, because of the, way, the, the life that they led, they also had time to create uh, fabrics and artifacts and beautiful things. And so we thought it was appropriate that way also to kind of, uh, honor their their memory yeah, that's nice. um, because they were a very artistic kind of people and so um, we figured that it would make sense uh, for those two reasons to call our nonprofit the Timuco Arts Foundation and then the model like for us like when we started we started because Elena and I could not find good chamber music whether it be jazz or whatever to either witness or participate in on my nights off and i we used to be uh, off on tuesday and wednesday at the beginning of the run and so mm -hmm. 
it was uh, very hard to to find anything good to 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 see on on these nights, and so we started concerts, and then we quickly realized that we touched a nerve, and we, you know. And Orlando is uh, one of these towns. Uh, I w- I guess it, it it's a little bit like L.A. where there's a lot of musicians, but there's a lot of work for musicians and steady work, and at the parks and for the tourism industry and for the food and beverage industry. But that's exactly it. Like musicians, very good musicians. They have full-time jobs and, you know, it's great. But very few outlets, especially back then, um, to uh, play the music they want to play or for artists to, you know, paint what they want to paint or, you know, apply that to whatever art form you you want. Um, uh, basically, there was very f- a few outlets for them to express themselves and to do something they actually enjoy for the sake of that art. And then so we... that we kept going because there was a demand for it from the performers as well as the audience. And that's the big thing here is that we, um, like my job is to make the performers experience a unique and magical one. And then Hélène and her team, their job is to make the audience experience uh, special, unique and magical. And so People bring their own beverage, wine, or whatever it is, and food to share. It's a very communal and social and um, casual experience. And yet, um, so like we actually have like these little tables in the room. You know, like people can put their drinks down in front of them, you know. Um, but yet they came to listen and to watch the artists. And so they came for the art. And so it's not like a bar. <laughs> and so you have these situations you know like that it's always a challenge as a musician i speak as a musician uh to match the music that you want to play with the audience that is there or that you want to be there and so match like it's you know you can think of it as business regular business like matching the demand and the supply right and um but you find in real life that usually you have two cases either you playing in a concert hall and then, you know, if you're an audience member, you're, you know, you're, you're afraid to like explain something to your kid or to open a, a, a lozenge, you know, wrapper because you don't, you don't want to make noise, <laughs> you know, which is, which is fine. But it's like, in other words, all the power is on stage. And then the other ex- case is that a lot of time, if you're going to play creative music, for example, you're playing in a bar. And then if you're playing in a bar or some kind of venue, like that, basically, you're there to make money for the owners. And so the priority is serving drinks and serving food or whatever else it is. And so there's no power on stage. All the, you know, like all you hear is the noise of the patrons talking and the right. the orders being taken and shouted to the cook and whatever it is, you know, the <laughs> glasses, you know, making noise together. And so we, we, our aim at the very beginning was to kind of get this, um, in, in this space where this you feel like it's oh this is this is this is special this i'm in a special place here you know and especially you know the house we built like when you get into the room it's a special place like it's on three levels and so it's not a huge room obviously it's only 100 and 100 seats like the, the my fire marshal limits us to 100 seats so um we could fit more we have fit more in the past but um but we don't anymore. <laughs> we follow the rules. But uh, but it's on three levels. And so you're never far from the stage. And you could like, and for the, the performers, you're never far from the audience. And they're there to listen to you. It's, it's a great experience. And so, and the acoustics, you know, this is my third space, acoustic space that I've either built or, you know, uh, uh, renovated like extensively. And so I get better every time. So the acoustics are great in the room and, uh, and we have projects too, to improve it and to improve, like to get a, a wings, like a, a green room and storage area for the piano and the equipment when not in use, because right now it's like the piano is always on stage and the drums and stuff is all in the lobby, like in our, in our personal lobby, <laughs> like it's <laughs> full of stuff. And so, um, and we don't have a real green room for the musicians. And so like they come to my office, which is my control room or, you know, in that lobby, which is like kind of uh, very, you know, uh, stuffed up stuff, stuff with stuff <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But, and we're, you know, we, we're going to get um, a variable acoustic control system, which means we, if we have an opera singer, we can actually turn the room into an opera hall 
for that singer to feel very even that much more comfortable like our room sounds good for a lot of things it sounds great for quite a few things um but like for a brass quintet for example it could be it could feel bigger and so we're going to have that in a few months we're going to have that so we'll be the only place in florida that has that kind of thing for uh for that purpose and so uh you know we keep pushing that envelope and that limit of how good the place can be <laughs> you know for the audience and for the the performers because everyone's going to benefit if the the acoustics are ideal for the performers the performer is going to perform better <laughs> and so the audience is going to get a better concert out of it you know and so and same thing for lighting for example like you know i light the artwork on the walls with with show lights with the ellipses you know because um ellipsoidals because i i i want to cut the light exactly to the piece and i want to focus it exactly on the piece and so and the same thing on stage like i i constantly reworking the lighting i have a, another project now that i'm going to redo the lighting again which means you know drilling another two inch hole through you know basically 24 inches of brick and concrete in between my control room and the, and the main room because i want to rewire everything and i want to have access to like uh, you know all 80 um uh, different light fixtures individually like i want to control them individually which right now i cannot i have a lot of control some control but not complete control it's not good enough i'm gonna <laughs> you know i go all in like the soundproofing in the room is is excellent and and it's excellent because we went through extreme to make it excellent and same thing for the noise floor for example is very very low because the ac is super quiet um, and then sound and isolation from outside uh, sound uh, or noise sources and the inside like other rooms like fridge and stuff like you know we basically went to extremes to make sure that the room was super quiet and so when you walk in the room like you can feel oh this is this is special here <laughs> i'm in a in a in a different place and that's exactly what the aim was and that's every week we are told by performers who've played all over the world and audience members that this is just a very very special place yeah it looks amazing and um brad you know firsthand told me some wonderful things about it from the acoustics to the kind of unusual um appearances and architecture and everything and speaking of brad he wanted me to ask you something that <clears throat> does sound uh, very interesting and i think offers a little more perspective on what you and uh, Elaine have created in the community, but Brad said, um, be sure to ask him about after opening his arms and home to the Orlando community, um, the community embraced him and his family by, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, intervening to stop deportation proceedings by having him declared a person of significant merit. Well, not deportation, <laughs> but I mean, I, I was trying to get my green card. I was here legally, uh, through work. Obviously I had a work, I had, I had the right to work here. But I was trying to get my green card and like, you know, like five years later and like $22,000 later, like they kept rejecting my green card application. And so, uh, the you know, basically like the, the newspapers, like, like radio people, like everybody got in on it and said like, this is ridiculous. Like this, you know, basically like, you know we we we're immigrants and we're still immigrants you know my son is going to be the first one to be an american citizen it should happen soon this year hopefully um but basically like uh, you know we devote our life to making our town a better place to live you know and we like basically give everything we have to the community that's what we do you know and it, we do it for us too i'm not saying that we're saints or anything like that but i mean um, and, and that's what like the newspaper said, for example, it's like, it was, uh, it was amazing because the whole community came together and the same thing when the city found out, because we know I didn't tell the city up front that I was having these concerts in my house, you know, I, and eventually like we were thinking of selling the house to the foundation so that we would have access to some grants that we don't have access to right now, mm -hmm. for example. And, um, and I wanted to know zoning wise, you know, what was 
the limitations and what was possible, you know. So I sent an email, like just an innocent email, asking a question to somebody at the city. And um, so they said, oh, let's meet and talk about it in person. I said, okay, fine. And I got there and there were 12 people around the table, like everybody was there. And uh, I couldn't have I couldn't ask a question because they asked all the questions and they said, oh, my God, uh, you have to stop that. Like, we were, you know, you can't do that in the home. It's a residential area, blah, blah, blah. So we they, we had to ask for a conditional use permit, which is a standard thing that you should do in this case. But by then, the support was so wide and far in the city. Like there was we had like. Many, many hundreds of emails of support and when we did like the surveys that you're supposed to do like you're supposed to do 500 feet radius we went 1500 feet radius and we still had like a hundred percent support from all our neighbors and all that stuff because we go to great lengths to make sure that we don't inconvenience our neighbors you know and so they they feel that like they know that and plus they come to the concerts when when they see something they like <laughs> and so um and so uh, you know that's what happens, you know, when you, when you give a lot, you get a lot. And so, so we, we gave it, we gave, basically we give everything we have, but we get everything in return, you know, and it was a very, uh, in both cases, it was a very uh, heartwarming thing because like, of course, like in the, in the immigration case, um, here in Florida, we deal with the Texas office. And so somebody in Texas wasn't reading my file properly, you know, and, and they kept reject, rejecting my application for reasons that, they would cite and then but the answers were right there in front of them they were just not reading the file and so uh, senator nelson um came to the rescue and said he made a one phone call and i'm not joking 24 hours later i had my green card like at least like over the phone they, they said oh i'm so sorry uh you're gonna get your green card you're approved like i'm telling you right now you're approved it's just a you know a matter of time before you get your green card you have to go get your fingerprint and you know, uh, however you call it, like, like the iris and all that stuff, like the bio, uh, uh, all the stuff you have to do the last step, you know, and then we got the green card. And so, but it was like, at the same time, it's very disappointing that, you know, when people talk about the immigration system in the United States and they say it's broken, I can attest to the fact that it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here, you know, I am, you know, a contributing member of society. Like, you know, I... Pay, I, I invested all my money here. I pay my taxes here, of course. I, I, like, I didn't invest anything outside of the country. Like, everything is here. And I contribute to the, you know, life of the social life of my community. And uh, yet, it still took five years and $22,000 to get a green card. Like, it's wow. ridiculous. Like, I could afford it at the time. But frankly, now that the show is closed, I couldn't anymore. Like I, there's no way I could do that now, you know. And um, and so it's it's broken. Like it's 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 broken. Like this, that's what needs to be fixed. Like it has to be, you know, uh, possible. Like basically for people to come here legally, and then you won't have any problems with illegal immigration because it will be possible to come here legally. It's not, you know. And uh, anyways, I could go on a on a rant about about immigration and and the the thing is the US is not the only country where it's difficult to emigrate to like Canada is also difficult and I'm Canadian and and it's still it's a lot easier than the United States but it's still um it's still, you know you, there's like bureaucracy involved and you have paperwork and all that crap and it which is fine but you know I've always you know I I toured the world in the 80s and 90s as a musician I always considered myself a citizen of the world you know and and it's nice to think like that and and it I think it makes better people it makes better citizens when you think like that like because you're less likely to to hate anybody you know <laughs> And to see that we're all the same and we all have the same aspirations and the same rights and the same, uh, um, you know, human, a human is a human, you know, but, uh, but in, in fact, technically on the ground, it doesn't work like that. And it's unfortunate, you know, but that's, that's life. Let's break to hear a little more of Benoit on trumpet from Mardi Gras at Timucua. Thank you. 
what you and Elaine have done is, is extraordinary. Um, I, I've talked a lot on this podcast about house concerts, which is kind of how you started. <laughs> and it's grown into something yeah. much more, but still kind of has at its heart, it has uh, that, part, at least part of it has that house concert um, spirit in it. But for right. someone who wants to build uh, to add to their community or enrich their own community with music and art at its center, what is the, um, you know, what is the number one tip or, or suggestion that you could give to them to, to get started? Well, and, and we always encourage that, right? So we have many people around here, around Florida, or in, even in other states, people who visited us and said, oh my God, I've, I'm going to start that too, you know? And um, so here's the thing. Um, you... I'm me and you have to be you. So it's the same as if I were to advise you on your career choices, if you're a student, for example, it's like I, there are ingredients that are needed for it to work and for it to be successful, but the recipe is different for everybody. Right. And so, um, so I would advise like, first of all, where we started and where we are now and where we want to be in, in five years or 10 years time. Like we have that vision still, like we, we, we do more than of course, just at the house because we have our resident new music chamber orchestra, which is called Alterity. They don't perform at the house. The orchestra is too big. And so we go to warehouses and we go to unused like retail space, uh, empty retail space. We go to other arts organizations, places we go to like weird kind of hip places that you wouldn't expect to see classical music at you know we teach composition for free at the library every sunday afternoon like we have all kinds of activities outside of the house but the house remains at the heart of what we do because it's the it's what has defined us through the years now our goal our objective i should say in the next five years is to become a major leading force in chamber arts in the southeast united states and in 10 years we would like to be that that the same thing on a national level and so that's our goal now you have to set your own goal because you're someone else right so if you want to start um uh concerts it could be in your house. It could be in a warehouse. It could be like, you know, you could, we have like a big truck, uh, trucking, like uh, mechanic place. Like they, they fix uh, semis and things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the bays are huge. Right. And uh, it's a daytime business. Right. So at night they're free and they're empty. Um, and so this is a place where we might have an event in the future because the the owner of the place came here and they have like, I don't know, I want to say 12 bays, like it's a huge, like it's a huge space inside. And so it has to be the appropriate event that's going to be in there because it's so big that if we do like a string quartet in there, it's just going to be lost, like it's not going to work, right? So mm-hmm. so that's my first advice. Like, first of all, get the pulse of, you have to know yourself, who you are. If you're not technical, don't try to do things technical. You know, if you're, if you are technical, then go for it, you know? <laughs> and then, Get the pulse of your community. What is missing? What is needed? What do people want? Or not necessarily what do people want now, but if, um, if, you, ha- if you and a small circle of friends feel a need for something, then fill that need. And so that ensures that something, it, it's going to work at least for your group of friends, you know? And then that group of friends is likely to have friends who are likely to have similar needs and wants and, you know, tastes, call it that. And so you do that. And so, you know, for example, we have a person who was inspired to start house concerts a long time ago, and they've been doing the house concerts now for many years. They like folk music. So all they do is folk. Once a month, they do have a folk, a folk concert because that's how they, that's how much they can handle. That's what they like. And it works for them. It's perfect. And uh, and then we have other people who like jazz and are, are actually there's a new place now they've started to do opera things and so they like opera 
And so they're like at the other end of town, you know, and they do opera things like about once a month or so. And that's great. That's how much they can like. So the the, the frequency of your events, uh, the type of events you have, the size of the crowd, like all of that stuff is dependent on who you are, what have, what you have access to as far as space and all that stuff. And if you have a piano or not, and all of these things uh, come into play. So that's my advice. Like, uh, and then the the visual arts, like we do plays here, we do you know all kinds of music, of course. Like basically, I'm I'm um, I take myself out of the equation in the in the in the taste department, okay. And so I have a I have a group of friends who help me program this thing because they give me advice on stuff that like genres of music or art that they know, and so they tell me this is super well done. If you can ha- get them, get them. And so I will do that. I will try to get them. I don't trust myself to like, you know, post grunge, hard, like whatever, you know. I don't <laughs> trust myself to like to, to know enough about every genre of music to to take these kinds of decisions and editorial decisions. And so I put a team together of people who complement my knowledge and uh, experience. And, you know, this way we are uh, more assured a wider palette of things that we offer. And so we do, you know, we've had the most experimental, you know, purely improvised, you know, basically sound explorations up to the strictest of adherence to Baroque, you know, or early music with you know, period instruments and all that stuff, like, and everything in between. And so including country and, you know, heavy metal and everything else. Like, so we're in a unique position because of the facility we have that's pretty versatile, um, that it accommodates all kinds of stuff. But if you don't have that, then don't try to do that because then you'll have a mismatch, a mismatch between the supply and the demand in one way or another, right? And so you don't want that. So whether it's what you can offer technically, like as far as the technical aspects of things, or the kind of music matching to the audience that you have, all of that stuff, it has to be a ba- It has to be balanced. It has to there has to be a good match between the supply and the demand. And so that's my first advice: do what you want to do how much you want to do it and for the people you want to do it in the place you want to do it, wh- whether or not it's in, in your house or not, like it doesn't matter. Like if, you know, some, a group of guys, you know, saw one concert here and they said, Oh my God. And we could do, I know what I want to do now. And so they went and they started a new performing arts center. It's a small space in a, like, uh, re-affected or, or, or renovated, where I call it what you want, like a, basically a warehouse in a little warehouse district in Winter Park in a town that's just like north of here. And um, and they, they, they have things like five, six nights a week. But basically it's like for them, like they have a bar, they have a, a beer and a, a wine license, you know, and stuff like that. So they have a different model and they do it. They do things their own way and they reach their own audience. And it's wonderful. It's not competition to us or, and we're not competition to them. And we have a big performing arts center, just a mile North of my house. We're not competing against them. You know, like they have these big Broadway shows and like, uh, whatever, like Elton John, you know, playing there. Elton John is probably not going to come play at my house. In fact, the one category of people I've said no to in the past were successful pop artists like some some like you know maybe not a a a, uh, a list but maybe b list like pop artists wanted to play at my house i said well i'm sorry you have so many options and um uh, and things open to you you don't need me you know and i'm going to keep doing things to fill a need which means that the performers who come here they need me they need my place otherwise they wouldn't have a place and we've brought like you know, Japanese, a Japanese percussionist who mostly plays gongs, you know, I mean, he bowed gongs, like all kinds of things is the sound exploration. Like if we don't bring him in here, he's never come to, he's never coming to Orlando ever, like, and so on and so forth. So like, basically we, we make, we fill the need for the audience 
because they can see some stuff they would never see otherwise in this town or and <laughs> we uh, fill a need for the performers because they would never come to Orlando if we didn't have a, a place for them to play and so this is why it's working and it's working well and so that's what everyone should do and I honestly think that everyone could participate in the cultural life of their town or their community in their own way and it it could be you know i mean we have like a third of our population in the metropolitan orlando area is latino and and many more of them are from puerto rico who came after maria and so we try especially hard to give them things like nestor torres who who's come several times now and um uh let's see we have like cuban players but all other people from uh puerto rico so that they can have music that they can relate to you know i mean of course they can relate to other genres of music but very few arts organizations cater to and try to basically uh offer a third of their programming that is latino and that's i mean we don't we're not quite at a third yet but we try to do that like we try to uh offer a lot of latino programming because we have a large latino population it makes sense you know it's like uh why should they uh you know uh not have access to anything that they like or that they're that they're they're part of that culture and so they come here and and this is why like this is what we're looking to have you feel when you come through those doors is you know you come in the lobby which is our dining room you come to our dining room and then you have like uh, swinging doors you know you c- come into the the living room which is the performance space and you know you you feel like you belong like you feel like you know the f- the the person it takes a special kind of person to go and see a concert in somebody's house that they don't know and this is what differentiates if you know differentiates us from other house concerts because we our our things are open to everyone and so we have people we don't know come into our house and so um i suppose it takes a special kind of person to invite people invite the world to their house but it also takes a special kind of person to go into somebody's home who they don't know and uh, and and so and that's why that place is so magical you know and that, that's why we keep doing it you um when your response here you you actually touched on quite extensively where the um musician fits into the into the scheme of this in, in your own heart and, and probably the, i'm sure the heart of elaine as well <clears throat> there is um, i've had a, a guest on here who um lives in san antonio texas and she yeah, I think she attended a house concert once upon a time, and she was so intrigued, and she um, kind of fits a profile that you describe, someone who likes um, folk and acoustic music. And so she she started her own, and, and um, like uh, Elaine, she um, focuses a lot on the side of making her guests feel um, very welcome through doing a lot of little little things for them, and of course the artists too. But I noticed, now she's not a musician, uh, so, you know, unlike yourself, she's not a musician, but she has taken to the, um, you know, I guess the plight <laughs> of the career musician. And I love that, that you've done that. And oh, yeah. I just wanted to underscore, I don't know if it makes you think of anything to add, but I just wanted to underscore for people who think about um, filling the need and adding art and culture to their community that the artists themselves, of course, uh, there's so much that is being offered to them here in your case and in the case of Amy. Um, Killingsworth, who generally, like yourself, has a um, a desire to help them in their well-being in their career, too. Right. Well, you know, for us, like one of the aspects of our mission, or one of the most uh, the pillars of our mission, is that we want to try, we want to make high-quality chamber arts, and chamber arts encompasses all of anything that can be done in a smaller place. Um, uh, May, and make it enjoyable and accessible to all. And so that's why we have pay what you want Sundays. That's why our ticket prices are only $20 um, uh, or $10 uh, or $5 on Saturdays because we want people to come and we want people who want to get 
you know, out of their house and make the effort to go see uh, and support a musician and an artist and buy some art maybe or whatever. Like we wanted to make it accessible. And so we don't think that their, their response or the appropriate response to filling the need of the cultural needs of a community is to have like, you know, Yo-Yo Ma or some famous musician for 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 which concert you're gonna have to pay 150 dollars to see like i mean yo Ma is great i i i want to go see him play live of course and uh, and gil shaham and all of these music like all of them of course if i if i could i would you know if i had time and money i would do that but to me it's making things accessible um so that you know and high quality things like we have i think this year we have 16 grammy winners and of course People from other countries, they have other, uh, the equivalent in, in, in Germany and in Canada, of course, the Junos and, and so, and, and South America, everybody has, you know, these kinds of like high level recognition um, and, and the artists who win that and they come to my house, you know, it's fantastic. And, uh, and, they're, and I'm making it accessible and affordable for everyone to come and, and, and see that. And that's what we want to do. And that also... Of course, one of the reasons why we do that, as, as I said, we do that for ourselves too, as much as we do it for the community, is, um, you know, I started composing uh, concert music when I got here. Like, uh, you know, in 2002, I started composing. I said, well, you know, where, you know, we already had started our concerts by, by then, but basically it's like, if I didn't have our concerts, I might not have started because what outlet would I have to have my music played in a concert situation um, except mine. And so we started like right in basically 2001, 2002, we, we always kind of pushed our musicians to say, um, uh, if you have a choice between playing a standard or a cover and an original tune, play an original tune. And so over the years, like it's 18 and a half years now, um, we've had like thousands of world premieres at the house because we always encouraged people to like, write new plays and you know it's like make something new <laughs> you know yeah. and at and at the same time and so the, there's a, a dual benefit to that the one benefit is to the musicians of course because they get their music played and the artists get their artwork seen being born in, in front of people's eyes and that kind of thing the play you know being played for the first time um, but the other thing is we're exposing our community to new music and new art. And this should, I mean, this happens everywhere. Like there's a French festival in your town, probably. There's yeah. like a, some kind of, uh, you know, a jazz festival, whatever. Um, but to me, it should be a year round, you know, a constant access to that new art, that art that's being created right now. Like if you go back in time and we let's let's stick to music because, you know, I, I, it's easier for me. But let's imagine that people in Beethoven's time were stuck uh, uh, at Mozart. Well, Beethoven would not have survived. Like, he would have become something other than a musician, than a composer, because he wouldn't have been able to make a living at it because everybody's still listening to Mozart. Well, luckily for him, people were open enough to new music that they let him write music and somebody hired him to play to you know commission this work blah 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 and he was able to survive and therefore we're now we have we're blessed with the 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 body of his work and then you keep going to everyone after beethoven and it was the same and it's like what we don't want uh is is now be stuck like in the jazz world be stuck at hard bop or 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 bebop you know or whatever the cool period and and nobody's doing anything new it's like that's not what we want same thing with the concert classical music like there's new music there's new composers out there right now composing music right now they their music needs to be heard by people right now <laughs> if we wait until they're dead or they become other some some other thing than composers we're going to lose out on a huge amount of great music and great art right so we the only way to get this great new music and great art is to encourage it and to go see it, you know? And so that's, that's another pillar of our mission because, and it started because I wanted my music played. And so 
Um, I was the one of the founding members of the Central Florida Composers Forum because it made sense to me that composers would get together and form like an association so that we would pool our resources and our talents so that it would ex uh, increase uh, our exposure because some of our, some of us are better known than others and and then and at the same time i give the the um the uh, association uh six concerts a year at the house and so they have like they have to produce right they have to keep writing music like we'll have let's say the next one is uh double read music we have like uh new electronic like live electronic music for Uh, games or uh, multimedia like um you know coming up in the summer like we have these these constantly to having to write new music like we have a piero ensemble this month like a piero ensemble uh, format concert coming up this month at the end of the month and so you know co composers have to keep writing music and they keep getting their music played but and so the flip side of that is audiences keeps hearing new music in different formats and by different composers who live right there in their neighborhoods and so this is everybody wins you know it's like that's um that's very important to me because like in the opera like i'm i'm in the process of working with a, a librettist to write a full-length opera right now and um you know there are there's there's one like every year somebody like one composer writes a full opera <laughs> And it may get played once, you know, but it's like, that's not good enough. You know, it's not good enough. So I'm going to write an opera and hopefully I'm going to, you know, put my contacts to work. And we, you know, it looks like I may have like uh, around the world, maybe a dozen performances lined up. Like when it, if it comes up and if it comes out and it comes out good, and if, you know, it's a, it's a multi-year project, that one. But I mean, still, I mean... I don't. I I want to get it heard. I want to. I want people to realize that there's um, new stories to be told, and there's different ways to tell these stories, and people deserve the right to you know to see these new stories. Imagine if in the film industry we we just watched the same movies over and over. Nobody made new new movies. Like you can't imagine that, right? I mean, but yet in the opera world, we keep, you know, seeing the same Puccini operas and the same like Donizetti's and, and Mozart. And they're great. But I mean, it's like there's like maybe 40 operas that get, you know, 99% of airplay, you know, <laughs> airtime. It's and, you know, and, and that makes no sense if in the movie world. It's as if we, you know, we watch the same 50 movies over and over again. And we didn't, we got the one new movie a year. Like it makes no sense, you know, yeah, and yeah. people don't look at it like that, but it, that's exactly the way you should look at it. Like it's, you know, and it's the same for pop music. It's the same for, you know, uh, every kind of art work or art form that you can think of sculptures and, uh, you know, visual arts, like imagine like 40 pieces of art and that's it, you know, and that's, you know, nobody's making anything new. That makes no sense, you know? We want both. We want to have access to the Mona Lisa and we want to see new stuff. And so hopefully we're part of that movement to kind of uh, rejuvenate and reinvigorate uh, like the, the, because we are a kind of a grassroots organization, we're actually more successful at it than when it's like big organizations who everything comes from the top, you know, like you can't f force things from the top, but you can move things when you're moving from the bottom. So... Cool. Well, Benoit, thank you a lot for spending time uh, with me today. I, I'm going to place your uh, website, benoitglazer.com, as well as your TEDx talk with Elaine, the Timuqua. Did I, I said it wrong again, didn't I? Yeah, no, that's good. The Timuqua, Timuqua.com is the website. Like my personal website, I'm, I'm sorry to say I don't spend any time uh, updating it and stuff like that. Um, it's much better for people to go to timuqua.com, okay. uh, youtube.com slash timuqua arts, vimeo.com slash timuqua. I mean, all of these places. And we have a Facebook page. Um, I have a personal Facebook uh, account as well. Um, and that's, you know, among all these things, people can find out if they're curious, they'll find out what they need to find out. So. Yeah, it's quite extraordinary um, what both you and uh, your wife and the foundation are doing. And, and uh, yeah, it's inspirational. I, I hope that we will talk again. I may actually be in Orlando.
Orlando later this year. I hope I can somehow catch a show or or at least meet for coffee if I can't catch a show. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. All right, Benoit. Well, thanks again, and I will talk to you again very soon. Hey, thanks for listening. Question for you. Are you struggling to move your music journey forward? I can help. If not personally, then by referring you to the next best available resources. Schedule a free 15-minute call with me to find out if I can indeed help you. It's easy. Just visit unstoppingmusician.com forward slash coaching to schedule your call today. Look for links to just about everything covered in this episode in the show notes at unstoppingmusician.com forward slash podcast. This episode was powered by the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth over and over again. It's available on paperback, Kindle, and ebooks just about everywhere you can find them. It's also available as a standalone podcast called the Unstarving Musician's Guide Podcast. You can learn more about the book and companion podcast at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash book. I'd love it if you picked up a copy and would love it even more if you left a review. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell.